Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Today, the United States and Cuba are taking the next step in restoring diplomatic relations with each other. Secretary of State John Kerry arrived in Havana to attend a ceremony marking the reopening of the U.S. Embassy there. Joining him are three Marines who lowered the flag at the U.S. Embassy in 1961, when the U.S. cut off ties to Cuba after Fidel Castro toppled the U.S.-backed government of Fulgencio Batista in 19. 1959. These same Marines will raise the flag over the embassy. We'll have more on Cuba after headlines. The Greek parliament passed a $95 billion bailout deal around daybreak this morning, after a contentious all-night debate. The draft terms of the agreement include harsh austerity measures. It does not include any debt relief. The program passed by a wide margin. But Prime Minister Alexis Tsipras faced a growing rebellion within his own left-leaning Syriza party, which came to power promising to fight against austerity. Nearly a third of Syriza lawmakers voted against the bill, including former finance minister Yanis Varoufakis, who blasted the vote as humiliating and non-viable. Officials say Cyprus is planning to hold a vote of confidence next week, and some suspect the government could be toppled. One of the dissenting Syriza lawmakers criticized his own party during the debate. And what is the Syriza independent Greek coalition government doing? After all the anti-austerity struggles they led, they are now introducing another lovely bailout. So what kind of government is this, where whatever the Greek people vote for, no matter what they fight for, or what the outcome of referendums is, yet still the bailouts always win? It is a name, the annulment of democracy, the dictatorship of the Eurozone over the neo-colony called Greece. Meanwhile, the terms of Greece's bailout, which will be the third in five years, are also facing growing criticism from European institutions that say they have, quote, serious concerns about Greece's long-term sustainability. In a new analysis, both the European Commission and the European Central Bank advocate for debt relief measures which have been opposed by Germany. Meanwhile, Nobel laureate economist Joseph Stiglitz has spoken out about Puerto Rico's debt crisis, as dozens protested in New York City in the latest action against hedge funds that have bought up the island's debt. In an op-ed in The Wall Street Journal, Stiglitz compares the crisis in Puerto Rico to that of Greece, writing, quote, Greece chose to join the Eurozone. Puerto Rico never chose to become an unincorporated U.S. territory. The U.S. must take responsibility for its imperialist past and neo-colonial present, Stiglitz wrote. At a protest Thursday outside the Manhattan offices of hedge fund Paulson & Company, protesters echoed the call for the United States to acknowledge the role of colonialism in Puerto Rico's debt crisis. Puerto Rico has an economic crisis with a $72 billion debt that is being charged to Puerto Rico to the people, despite Puerto Rico being a colony of the United States and the debt is owed to U.S. corporations. We're here to protest the actions of shareholders, such as Paulson, who is one of the major shareholders taking money from Puerto Rico today. Britain has announced plans to challenge Ecuador's decision to provide asylum to WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange in its London embassy. On Thursday, Hugo Swire of the British Foreign Office said in a statement, quote, Ecuador must recognize that its decision to harbor Mr. Assange more than three years ago has prevented the proper course of justice. In response, Ecuador's foreign ministry released a statement saying it saddened Assange's confinement has lasted so long, adding its government has offered 31 times to facilitate an open judicial process in Sweden. This comes just a day after Swedish prosecutors dropped part of their sexual assault inquiry against Assange, but the most serious part of the probe remains in place, although the Swedish government has never charged him with a crime. We'll have more on Julian Assange later in the broadcast. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has expressed profound grief over Japan's actions in World War II, echoing apologies made by previous Japanese leaders. Abe's remarks were closely watched by China and South Korea, which endured Japanese occupation and colonial rule. As Japan marks 70 years since its surrender following the U.S. nuclear bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Abe pledged Japan would never wage a war again. Never again repeat the devastation of war. Aggression, war, we shall never again resort to any form of threat or use of force as a means of settling international disputes. We shall abandon colonial rule forever and respect the right of self-determination of all peoples throughout the world. 
Despite his remarks, the Japanese prime minister has pushed for a rewriting of Japan's pacifist constitution to allow Japanese troops to fight abroad for the first time since World War II. In Germany, migrants are experiencing an increasing number of hate crimes. In the first half of this year, the Interior Ministry recorded more than 200 attacks on the housing of refugees, including arson and vandalism. Activist groups say there have also been nearly 50 attacks on individual migrants. Nearly 180,000 people have applied for asylum in Germany this year, many of them Syrians. The Interior Ministry has called the pattern of crimes unacceptable. At the same time, we also know that there is a growing number of attacks against asylum seekers and institutions for asylum seekers, less so in Eisenhutenstadt, but in other places. That is incomprehensible, unacceptable, and undignified for our country. We will work against this with all the strength of the rule of law and political power that we have. Back in this country, in Texas, police are investigating the murder of Shade Schuler, a 22-year-old African-American trans woman. Her decomposed body was discovered in late July in a field in northeast Dallas. It's taken police two weeks to identify her. Schuler's at least the 13th transgender woman to be murdered this year. In news from Ohio, a new video has surfaced of 37-year-old African-American woman, Raukina Jones, pleading with Cleveland jail authorities to administer her medication only hours before she was found dead in her cell. Jones was arrested after a dispute with her ex-husband in late July. When she entered jail, she told authorities she needed to take her three medications, the generic version of the sedative Xanax, the ADHD medicine Adderall and an anti-epilepsy drug. She was found dead in her cell two days later. In the video released Tuesday, Rakina Jones tells a jail guard it's important for her to have her medication administered correctly because, quote, I don't want to die in your cell. I, I'm not asking any exception to any rules. Yeah. But what I will tell you is I don't want to die in your cell. Oh, do you? Are you having a seizure? You're taking medication, or what was going on? I had my medication then. One, yeah. two. I have a brain injury. California Governor Jerry Brown signed into law two measures on police accountability introduced earlier this year. The first measure bans the use of secret grand juries in deciding whether to indict police officers who kill people while on active duty. The second measure affirms people's right to film the police. Other measures, such as the use of police body cameras, are stalled in the California legislature. Meanwhile, the Connecticut Supreme Court declared the death penalty unconstitutional. In 2012, the governor signed legislation abolishing the death penalty in Connecticut, but the law exempted prisoners who are already on death row. On Thursday, Connecticut's Supreme Court ruled 4-3 to three in favor of arguments that executions carried out after the abolition of the death penalty represent cruel and unusual punishment. The decision spares the lives of 11 people currently on death row. In Ecuador, indigenous groups organized nationwide strikes and demonstrations Thursday to protest President Rafael Correa's efforts to change the Constitution so he can seek a fourth term of office. Groups block the Pan American Highway and other major roads as labor unions refuse to work. A leader of the protest spoke out. We will continue to fight indefinitely. We will defend ourselves. This has been resistance, and today we have come together under the flag of struggle, the flag of resistance. Meanwhile, in Paraguay, an 11-year-old girl has given birth after she was denied an abortion at 10 years old. Her pregnancy drew international attention after Paraguay, which bans abortion except in cases that endanger the life of the mother, refused to allow her to have the procedure. Her stepfather has been accused of raping the girl, resulting in the pregnancy. Back in the United States, the nonprofit behind the beloved children's show Sesame Street has announced it'll be airing the program on the premium cable network HBO for the next five seasons. After nine months, the episodes with, will be re-aired on PBS, which has been home to the show for the last 45 years. In news from the campaign trail, former Vice President Al Gore is reportedly considering joining the 2016 presidential race. Gore lost the 2000 election to George W. Bush, despite winning the popular vote. The speculation about a potential run in 2016 surfaces as both Democratic and Republican candidates are soapboxing at the Iowa State Fair today and into the weekend. 
And 21 young people in the United States have sued the Obama administration over climate change. The federal lawsuit argues climate change violates the public trust doctrine, which requires the government to protect resources essential to the survival of future generations. In the suit, the 21 youths demand the court order federal agencies to develop a plan to decrease concentrations of carbon in the atmosphere to through 50 parts per million by the year 2100. Renowned climate scientist James Hansen, who's a co-plaintiff in the lawsuit, argues it's essential to reduce carbon levels to this target in order to avoid the most catastrophic impacts of climate change. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Juan Gonzalez. Welcome to all our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world.